Okay, so good morning, everybody uh, here in the offline audience and in the online audience uh, to our today, uh, to today's breakfast meeting, the first of three meetings on the South China Sea conflict. Um, I'm happy to welcome our two panel speakers, Alan Chung. He's a research, uh, a research fellow, senior research fellow at the Raja Ratman School uh, of International Studies in Singapore. So he joins us from very far. Um, thank you. Um, Alan has uh, done re has done extensive research on the question of uh, of the South China Sea conflict, um, and he's published extensively in very renowned international uh, journals. And the second. Uh, Panel speaker is Alfred Gerstel. He joins us from Vienna. He should have been today with me, sitting right next to me, but unfortunately his flight has been canceled. So now he uh, he's online as well, uh, but I'm happy that uh, he could make it anyway because he had to get up very early today uh, to get his flight that was then canceled. Um, Alfred is a senior researcher at the uh, Palatsky University in uh, in Olmütz in the Czech Republic, and he too is a is a, a renowned pundit um, regarding the on the question of the South China Sea conflict. Uh, he's done extensive research, uh, especially on uh, ASEAN countries, so the countries that are directly involved in this conflict. Um, as announced in our um, um, in the uh, as written in our announcement today, we're going to have a deeper look into the history of the conflict and the state actors involved and their interests. And this is why I would like to start uh, with Ellen. Um, I know that he's prepared a very insightful uh, presentation with a lot of maps, so uh, very illustrative. And uh, so, Ellen, please, could you tell us, tell us a little bit more about the history of the conflict uh, in the South China Sea, uh, the state actors may be involved and, and also their interests, uh, their specific strategic interests, whether they're political, economic, or, uh, or whether they have other interests as well. Yeah. There, there are six claimants in the South China Sea dispute, uh, and oh. mo most of them um, are actually making these claims uh, in the late 20th century. Although uh, I will, in the course of my presentation, allude to the fact that there were international legal implications stemming from the ending of World War II, which actually started the dispute in earnest. But it is only in the late 20th century when uh, resources were finally discovered beneath the seabed that everybody started making these claims. And of course, the other thing was that the, the huge irony was that the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, pardon the noisy background, I don't know why, um, you know, facilitated more claims than, than were originally in the sea because the baselines en enable a lot of the Southeast Asian claimants to suddenly project uh, maritime claims far into the offshore waters. Okay, I don't know why there's a background scene. Uh, do, would you like to, uh, did you put up the, the PowerPoint or like the presentation or not? I have not shared, but I can share. Can can everyone hear me? Because it's, yes, it's... we can hear you. Uh, should we have? Uh, should we put up your PowerPoint presentation? Yes, please. Yes. Yes, it's safe for that. Way. Okay. Okay. Sorry for the coordination. All right. If I lower my volume, is this better? No, that's okay. We we hear you clearly, and it's not too loud. Okay, this is perfect. All right. Uh, All this right. is a standard uh, map on the left. If you have for us, but we assume we do have backward noise, then it might be the case that it's because of the yeah, feedback sound from Bergen. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. But for us, it's a bit difficult to listen to. Maybe I, I unmute myself. Yeah, please try, Julia. Okay, is this better now? Oh, it's much better, yes. Yeah. All right. Okay, so it's the Bergen sound. <laughs> um, 
all right, the map you see on the left is a pretty standard one. It's it's a layman's map of the South China Sea dispute. Uh, and Alfred, of course, having published a recent book on it, will be able to uh, you know spend more time elaborating on how these two sets of islands, the Paracels and the Spratlys, are linked. And when you refer to the South China Sea disputes, it's basically these two islands. Of course, there could be little islets in between the two of them that could you know spark also. Uh, political contentions, but by and large, it's the Spratlys and the Paracels. And you see how close these islands are uh, to Southeast Asia, uh, the 10 member countries of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, and of course, I'll show you later the other claimants like the Philippines, uh, Malaysia and Brunei. Um, you also note that uh, these islands appear somewhat distant from Taiwan. And uh, Taiwan, of course, uh, I'll leave some of this to Alfred later, is an interesting uh, claimant as well, considering its relative distance. Uh, you know, so that's interesting. Now, the second picture on the right uh, was taken sometime in the 1990s when you see most of these islands, either the Paracels or the Spratlys, were barely crops of rock which could not su support any life forms. Next slide, please. And of course, um, next slide, please. Yeah. Okay, on the left is the heavily built up uh, features on China's controlled islands in the spread lease. Obviously, the transformation from the 1990s to the present is dramatic. Uh, now, you technically cannot say that these are islands that cannot support life. They can support life. You look at the greenery on the reclaimed island. This is what China calls the Nansha uh, Tao. Um, again, you know, China has deliberately, you know, renamed the islands, uh, you know, to, to give it a Chinese identity and so on. And of course, what's also obvious from this aerial photo is the fact that it's got a full-scale runway, which presumably can take in uh, medium-haul passenger jets, something in, in your range of the Boeing 737 or up to the Airbus uh, A330s. So that is significant. Of course, if you can accept the landing of such large passenger aircraft, it means that military-grade fighter jets, short-range bombers, uh, reconnaissance aircraft, search and rescue aircraft can all use the same runway. So that's significant. Now, I also want to draw attention uh, to the other claimants, such as Malaysia. Now, this tourist advertisement is interesting because it tells you that the Malaysians all right, no, no, it's the Malaysians rather than the Chinese who have actually used tourism in a very political way to reinforce their claim. Uh, the Malaysian claim, which I will show you in, in a map, uh, roughly three slides down, uh, is quite exotic. Exotic in the sense that they projected uh, their baselines uh, for the exclusive economic zone, and hence that covers one little islet in the Spratlys archipelago, which they've renamed Layang Layang. Uh, so this Layang Layang island has been transformed into a long-standing dive resort. Uh, and what you see on, on the, the advertisement here tells you how well built up it is. You know, to have the Malaysian tourism board uh, uh, tell you that it's a legitimate location for a dive vacation uh, tells you something. Uh, they, they, they don't expect any fighting. They expect the fish to be there. And that, you know, they can make money off a disputed island uh, and so on. And of course, the Malaysians have actually beat the Chinese to building a runway on the claim island, which is something which people conveniently forget. So the Chinese were not the first to build a runway. Then very soon after, Vietnam tried to do the same. Uh, but of course, the Vietnamese were slower than the Chinese. So the Chinese technically hold position number two. Um, okay, next slide, please. Now, I have to go through this legal conundrum that, uh, you know, characterizes the South China Sea dispute. Uh, and of course, Alfred will have his own take on this. Uh, you have to understand uh, that uh, the South China Sea dispute became a dispute in international legal terms, uh, in part because of the settlement after World War II in the Pacific. Um, it was a matter of trying to end Japan's state of war with all of the allied powers and in particular with China. 
Um, okay, I'll show you in the next slide this excerpt uh, from the so-called San Francisco Treaty that formally ended World War II in the Pacific. Uh, and of course, the, all of us who study international relations would remember the 1952 San Francisco Treaty as not only ending World War II in the Pacific, but also simultaneously ushering in the renowned American arbitrage uh, hub and spokes security system, whereby the US-Japan Security Treaty forms the hub from which the United States extended security guarantees to all its uh, declared and undeclared allies uh, along the so-called uh, Pacific Rim. All right, and the San Francisco Treaty uh, basically uh, allowed Japan to finally say, okay, I give up uh, any claims to all the territories which I had occupied during World War II and so on. Uh, and I'll show you the interesting clause in a short while. Uh, and what's also interesting stemming out of this 1952 San Francisco Treaty is the fact that the then uh, Chinese nationalist government, uh, which had been by that time forced to retreat to present-day Taiwan, uh, signed this corollary called the Taipei Treaty, which was basically you know, to acknowledge that the San Francisco Treaty will be honoured by the nationalist government uh, sitting in Taipei uh, on behalf of uh, what they claim to be their legitimate uh, you know, Republic of China, as opposed to uh, Mao Zedong's People's Republic of China's occupying the mainland uh, and so on. So it, you see how tangled it is. It's Japan and the two Chinas uh, coming out of uh, World War II. And of course, uh, China, Taiwan, and increasingly Vietnam are using a, a very unusual cocktail of law and history as justifications for claiming uh, most or all of the uh, South China Sea. Uh, I also want to highlight the Philippines' unusual claim uh, and of course, one, one might think that this is extraordinary, but still, you know, it, it is uh, something that still happens today. Uh, an intrepid explorer carrying a Philippine passport says, oh, I've discovered this new, uh, you know, rocky outcrop. Uh, so the, the Philippine claim, uh, you know, stands on this so-called uh, chance discovery by this explorer by the name of Thomas Cloma. Um, and, and he called it, called his discovery the Kalayaan Islands or Freedom Islands in Tagalog. Uh, South Vietnam, okay, again, the Vietnam War also left its imprint, its legal imprint. South Vietnam, ironically, uh, succeeded where the Japanese left off with the 1952 treaty. It claimed to have physically occupied both the Spratly and Paracel Islets from 1962. And of course, we know that the Vietnam War played out to the demise of South Vietnam. And uh, now, unsurprisingly, the, the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, the, the, the current uh, sovereign holder of uh, uh, the, the entire Vietnamese state, would say, oh, since my erstwhile Civil War rival had owned these islands, so therefore I succeed in controlling them as well. Uh, then, of course, there was Anklos. Now, Anklos... Uh, well, depending on how we want to look at it, was both a boon and a bane for these island disputes because uh, UNCLOS allowed coastal states uh, to project this thing called the Exclusive Economic Zone, EEZ, uh, you know, as an extension of their territorial maritime waters. And this, of course, meant that uh, all of a sudden, unexpected claimants could come out of the blue, uh, like Malaysia, for instance, Brunei. Uh, Vietnam is... If you recall the, the previous two uh, pictures I showed you, uh, seemed like a natural claimant. But Brunei, Malaysia, this seemed, you know, uh, quite out of the ordinary. All right. Uh, the Philippines, of course, was more than happy to use UNCLOS because it was close enough. And, and UNCLOS gave it, you know, strong legal justification to say, all right, you know, I can make a solid claim. And so on. Then, of course, we know that in 2016, there was this famous uh, permanent Court of Justice, uh, sorry, Permanent Court of Arbitration, sorry for the misspelling, that PCA, uh, ruling about uh, the South China Sea Islets as contested territory. It was the first time that an international body made a clear ruling about how all these South China Sea Islands were actually contested territory and that no particular claims could 
be definitively resolved as as of today. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the Philippines celebrated the Philippines celebrated this as a huge victory at the time because the PCA basically said, uh, you know, since it's contested territory, anybody could fish there, including Philippine fishermen uh, and so on. Okay, the next slide, please. Okay, the San Francisco Treaty. This is something you can pull off the internet from the excellent directory that the United Nations has put online for us researchers. Uh, now, Article 2, the last clause there, uh, F, Japan renounces all right title and claim to the spread the islands and to the Paracel Islands. This sounds like, you know, an invitation to a land grab. So if Japan renounces all right, uh, the question which the treaty left unanswered was, who succeeds to it? So when I mentioned the Taipei Treaty, which came into effect uh, hours after this one came into effect, uh, was negotiated as a kind of uh, reparations and end of war agreement between Tokyo and Taipei in 1952. That one seemed, according to some legal historians, to give the sanction to the government in Taipei uh, to succeed where Japan renounced rights. Uh, but today, he realized that Taiwan technically controls only one part of the spread lease. Spar Paracels, absolutely nothing. Uh, you know, and, and, uh, and this is where Alfred can come in later. Uh, perhaps disingenuously, the government in Beijing would say, oh, since my Erswa civil war rival in Taipei had claimed the South China Sea, especially the Spread the Islands. Therefore, we should succeed to that claim. Uh, blah, blah, blah. All right. Uh, now, next slide, please. Now, this is where I need to show you, okay, the two maps are incomplete huh, because they were taken from uh, news websites. Huh? Let me make it clear. Pulled off Google. So the Malaysian claims huh, uh, are best seen from the, the, the diagram on the left. Uh, the very light green lines you can see that um, Malaysia has two parts, all right? The so-called West Malaysia, which is the, that part immediately to the north of Singapore on the left. Uh, you see they've projected this exclusive economic zone that is slightly short of the South China Sea, the main South China Sea dispute. But if you look at the other two states of uh, Malaysia, they call it collectively East Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak on the right, of this gigantic island of Borneo, the fact that these two states are there allows the Malaysians to actually project their claims right into uh, the roughly the midpoint of the Spratly archipelago. And therefore, that's where the famous resort of Layang Layang sits. All right. And of course, uh, there's Brunei, that faint orange line, uh, orange rectangle there. Now, this, this is, if, if Unclos did not exist, it would be an incredible claim. You know, all of a sudden, this little kingdom, all rich by its own, uh, you know, through its own territorial waters, you know, so can project its EEZ just straight out like that. And of course, Brunei technically controls nothing right, of the physical uh, islets in the spread lease. But still, if you were Brunei, would you not want to claim it under UNCLOS? Of course you would, because, you know, it's an extension of your current you know, oil and gas deposits. And of course, there's Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnamese claim, I think, very clear, both in the diagram on the left and on the right. Uh, in the diagram on the left, it is the dark blue line. Uh, very clearly, you know, the entire spread lease and paracels lie off the coast of Vietnam. And with the assistance of UNCLOS, you can extend it all the way to virtually a large chunk of the spread lease and the entire paracels. Uh, and so on. But of course, China uh, wins the prize for perhaps disingenuously drawing this nine dash line, which is represented by the dark purple line on the left or the dark red line on the right, where it claims that uh, you know the entire South China Sea, including both sets of islands, are under the Hainan uh, Special Administrative Region uh, and so on. And of course, the Philippines uh, would project its claim, uh, you know, directly off its many islands. Uh, and, and for the Philippines and Vietnam, I suppose it's reasonable because you can just project your EEZ from roughly where your coastlines are. 
Um, now, having said that also, I must make some criticism of UNCLOS. Uh, and of course, Alfred can disagree with me if he should choose to. Uh, UNCLOS also opened up a lot of vagaries in these claims because, you know, if you look clause by clause, UNCLOS actually says that you can invoke natural coastlines like bays and, and coves, you know, that, that have historically been proven to have been uh, used by your people or, or used by your maritime jurisdiction, and you project your claims from these so-called coastal baselines. But it could also mean contention because when do you project a baseline from uh, an indented curve that does not project forward but inwards or, or in an inward orientation? Whereas some of these states, uh, like uh, Philippines, obviously, you know, have claimed that, you know, we draw a straight line around our coast, whether they're indentations or not. And that's how you project such a large claim for your EEZ that includes the, a large chunk of the Spratly Islands. And of course, you look at Brunei. Um, you know, Brunei has, if you look at the physical relief of the territorial domain of uh, the, the landed part of Brunei, you know, it is also somewhat disingenuous, if you ask me, uh, because you're projecting a, a very extended EEZ, you know, from your very minimal coastline. And, and how is this logical? Uh, it's not logical unless you refer to UNCLOS, which allows you these kinds of loopholes. Okay, next slide, please. Now, the, big, the, the other big factor that uh, intensifies this South China Sea dispute is of course nationalism and uh, it's linked to what some claimant states call the advanced considerations of territorial revitalization. Uh, the Philippine case from 1956, if you recall that little story I told you about Thomas Cloma uh, saying, oh, I discovered these new islands, therefore they are uh, uh, new territories belonging to the new Philippine uh, Federation and so on. So this gives a boost uh, to the post-colonial state, uh, in this case, the Philippines. And the Philippines, uh, as Alfred will also uh, second later, uh, is, is not always a victim of territorial encroachment from its neighbors. You know? it, it is also equally guilty of trying to claim some of its neighbors' borderlands as part of a historical uh, form of revitalization of what the Philippines used to be before Spanish and American colonialism and so on. So, you know, this kind of dynamic about going back to history or ransacking history uh, to say that, okay, now that we are independent, sovereign and modern, uh, we can project our claims based on maps that we've surfaced from several centuries back. Uh, so the Philippines are, are not innocent in the sense that, you know, their claims are also sometimes extremely opportunistic. Taiwan or Chinese Taipei, uh, depending on which part of the one China policy you want to stand on, uh, would of course attach its claim to uh, what I've described as the uh, vagaries stemming from the San Francisco Treaty and that its corollary, the Taipei Treaty, and so on. And there is good reason that uh, Taiwan slash Chinese Taipei keeps using this phrase, Republic of China, implying that the civil war, the Chinese civil war, that seemed to have, uh, you know, a de facto ended in 1949 with the proclamation of the People's Republic on the mainland, has not quite ended. Because if uh, Taiwan Chinese Taipei retains this title, Republic of China, it can technically claim that uh, it is a logical inheritor of the Spratlys and Paracels according to the San Francisco Treaty and the Taipei Treaty of 1952, all right? And of course for China, and, and I, I say most of this space for Alfred since he has just published a book, uh, ending the so-called century of humiliation is linked to uh, taking out uh, control over the Spratlys and advancing this Chinese dream of a strong, prosperous, great power. Uh, China cannot uh, concede an inch uh, on these so-called alienated colonial territories uh, if it's to seriously pursue its dream of actually uh, realizing itself as a great power, great nation, and so on and so forth. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, the current president has shifted from his 
uh, you know, predecessors okay, in plural, uh, view that uh, the claims on the South China Sea should be put on the shelf or frozen indefinitely. Instead, Xi Jinping has pursued what's called wolf warrior diplomacy. If necessary, we need to actively and, and, and loudly prosecute these claims uh, and so on. So the South China Sea Islands, uh, especially the Spratlys, have been labeled as core interests. Uh, and of course, they've been very clever in invoking this whole range of reasons as to why China should control uh, the Spratlys. Uh, they claim that, okay, we're advancing hum uh, uh, internationally humanitarian, re humanitarian and relevant scientific marine research. Um, they are preparing to render all sorts of search and rescue SAR assistance to all passing vessels. Uh, they, and, and in the name of doing that, they've justified building lighthouses. All right. Uh, and of course, they've also, uh, just like Vietnam and, and Malaysia, actively uh, you know, promoted the Spratly Islands as destinations for patriotic tourism. Uh, I, I, I have my limits to what I can show you in terms of pictures, but you can Google for uh, how China has actually encouraged its patriotic tourists to wear T-shirts that illustrate the Nine Dash Line whenever they visit some of these Southeast Asian countries. And of course, up, it's up to the Southeast Asian host governments whether to ban these tourists for, quote-unquote, wearing offensive T-shirts uh, and so on. Okay, my last few slides. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is my third generic point. Um, if you look at the angle of energy security and i understand those of you tuning into this from europe will realize that this also speaks to your current predicament vis-a-vis -vis russia ukraine and of course all of southeast asia is uh, extremely anxious to secure long-term energy supplies as well and uh, in this regard uh, china is not necessarily the villain all right uh if you look at uh, what has been estimated by uh, you know, an assortment of oil and gas companies, um, the deposits for, okay, I draw your attention to the left side picture here. The deposits for liquefied natural gas, all right, is given a figure of 6.0, all right, in the middle of the picture there. And you compare that to the, the measly amounts uh, being imported from the Middle East, uh, you know, it stands to reason Ellen, that if Ellen. you have, yeah, okay, I'll wind this up quickly. Uh, Ellen, that if, and, yes, Alan, I, I, I'm, 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 I don't want to interrupt you, but we only have one hour. Could you okay. please? I'll, I'll wind this up. Quickly. Otherwise, Alfred uh, does not have uh, chances to also to respond to uh, to what you just said. Yeah, okay. maybe if you could wrap it up a little bit. Thank you. Okay, sure. All right. So, you know, if you were a fresh claimant state that happened to take advantage of UNCLOS, would you want to give it up? Obviously not. All right. And of course, uh, the hydrocarbon map on the right tells you about the rest of the oil deposits that have been projected to be lying there untapped. All right. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to show you this picture. Uh, and of course, these slides, depending on copyright issues, uh, can be made available to you after this presentation. Uh, everybody has a finger in this pie, all right? It's not just the six claimants. It's also got to do with all these uh, government-linked um, oil and gas corporations, including the Chinese, the Malaysians, the Vietnamese, Shell, all right? Conoco Phillips, Chevron, and so on, uh, and so on. Okay, last slide, please. Okay, this last slide uh, brings the story up to the present. Uh, while the world was distracted with COVID-19 uh, recovery and now the Russia-Ukraine war, the Chinese have continued sending exploratory oil rigs uh, into the Vietnamese parts of the EEZ. All right. So I draw your attention to where the Chinese have already started you know, actively drilling for oil and natural gas. Okay, The CNOOC uh, is the China National uh, Oil Company. Uh, they've drilled all around Hainan Island and uh, south of Hong Kong. And it's no stretch of the imagination for them to try to sneak uh, some exploration down into the Vietnamese clean waters colored in orange there. So that's what they've been doing under the cover of the world's distraction with COVID-19 and the Russia-Ukraine war. All right, so there is a lot at stake. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much for, for this uh, wonderful and very detailed insight. Uh, I think we've all learned a lot. Um, I would like to, um, you, you gave already, uh, you hinted already to Alfred's um, expertise on China. And Alfred recently published also a book um, or books, <laughs> not only one book. <laughs> um, and I know also from the past, because I know Alfred from Vienna, uh, he's done a lot of research on, on China's Belt and Road Initiative and, uh, and also China's perception, the perceptions of China in the As Asian countries. So maybe you could give us a little bit, Alfred, uh, like your insights into uh, China's interests and especially how these interests are perceived in the ASEAN states and its activities, obviously. Thanks, Julia, first of all, for inviting me to Bergen. Unfortunately, as already mentioned, I'm stuck in Vienna, but hopefully soon I can catch up with you in Bergen. And thanks also a lot, Ern, for, for your excellent introduction. Julia, you mentioned my, my book, and not only to, to make advertisement. So I looked at the so-called hatching strategies of Southeast Asian actors against China, but also the United States. And in particular, I had to look at their relations with China. And I used the South China Sea as a kind of example for negative relations with China and the Belt and Road Initiative for positive relations. However, the perception on the Belt and Road Initiative are also mixed in Southeast Asia. So that's also very fascinating because there is criticism that the projects are very costly, that the, also usually the workforce employed implementing the projects are Chinese. That's a particular case in, in Laos, but also in other countries. Also in the Philippines, for instance, there are fears of Chinese migration, legal and illegals, related to the Belt and Road. So they are very mixed perception. But back to the, to the South China Sea, let me just add the most recent developments building on Ellen, and I will not contradict you, on the contrary, because if we look at the legal dimension, which will be the topic on in two days, so I'll just briefly touch on it, UNCLOS, or, yeah, UNCLOS was definitely a catalyst for, yeah, for making the situation politically, diplomatically worse, because since 2009, we monitor that China behaves more assertive towards the Southeast Asian nations. But in fact, this is a response to a legal initiative of Malaysia and Vietnam. Just a few weeks earlier, they submitted their claims in the South China Sea to a United Nations Commission. Then China responded with sending their nine dash line map to the same UN Commission. And Afterwards, there were more political and also military clashes in the South China Sea. Also important to mention is that since 2013, there is um, increased tension because China has started to build military, uh, artificial islands, sorry, and militarize them. But it's not only China, Vietnam does the same. However, China militarizes seven or eight island, islands and Vietnam only two. But so there is a pattern, but of course, China demonstrates that is more powerful than, than the others and moves forward with a tactic we can call salami slicing tactic. So China is actually, yeah, sets some actions and waits how the other claimants respond, and in particular, the United States. So unlike Vietnam, so Vietnam is a quite strong military actor. That's something we have to keep in mind. But in comparison, Malaysia, Philippines are not powerful enough to check China militarily. Completely different regard to the United States. The United States regularly conducts so-called freedom of navigation operation, which means the sail through the 12 nautical mile zone of the Chinese claimed islands or overfly them with the military planes. So far, China can't do anything against it, just protesting, but they still have not the military power to confront the United States openly. For the Southeast Asian nations, it's very difficult to, to respond wisely to, to China's aggression or yeah, assertiveness. So they're not clearly bandwagoning with China, 
but they're also not bandwagoning with the United States or balancing with the US against China. So what they are doing is promoting or pursuing a policy which is in between, and that's the so-called hedging strategy. So hedging is basically a combination of seeking close relations, both with the United States and China, with China mainly economically, but as I've mentioned, even cooperation under the Belt and Road frame is contested because there are fears of becoming too dependent on China, in particular in, in Vietnam. And in regard to security cooperation, there are also some talks. There is even collaboration with China, but the key partner is the United States. So United States is the security guarantor for most of the Southeast Asian nations. And the Philippines are lucky because they have a mutual defense treaty with the United States. Vietnam doesn't have it, but they have close security cooperation as well. But even for the Philippines, it's really it's a very fine balance because can they fully rely on the US military? Would they really assist, support them if there would be a military confrontation between China and the Philippines and the South China Sea? Just a few days ago, President Biden has confirmed President Marcos, that United States would defend Philippine territory, but we all know that there might be a Trump two presentation presidency ahead of us, and then we don't know how the situation will, will unfold. So in other words, it's a very fine balance that the Southeast Asian claimant states have to find, and they are basically responding to the behavior, to the actions of China and the actions of the United States. And some were in between, they have to find their niche to, to navigate. The same applies for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So ASEAN is not a conflict party. It's also not a mediator, but it's a platform for China and the Southeast Asian claimants to talk especially about the so-called regional code of conduct to build mutual trust. But otherwise, it doesn't get involved too much because also the interest of the 10 member states are, are way too, too different. I would like to, to leave it here and maybe there are some, some questions from the audience to, to focus on one or two countries more specifically, maybe Taiwan, for instance. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I would definitely, I'm definitely interested in Taiwan, but uh, I will leave that uh, to the audience later. Um, I have another question to the both of you. Uh, um, one, one, because Alan lives in the region, and second, because uh, Alfred, you traveled there a lot and, uh, and you've, uh, you've researched the region. For us, like living in Europe and I don't know, especially in Norway or also in Norway, this conflict is very far away. So when we learn about new developments, it's because something really extraordinary happens, something uh, maybe a game changer or something very more perilous, uh, perilous events. So how, how present is the South China Sea conflict in um, in the daily lives and the, uh, and the politics, the, uh, the like the daily politics uh, in uh, in the countries, does it also affect uh, elections, for example, in the region? Okay. I don't know who wants to. Yeah. Um, all right. I haven't covered uh, the electoral impact of um, the South China Sea dispute uh, in detail. <clears throat> But for countries that do not have uh, open and competitive democratic systems, uh, such as Vietnam, uh, you realize that the South China Sea can be a tremendous mobilizer when it comes to events like Communist Party Congresses and so on. Uh, it, it's a way of whipping up nationalism in support of regime legitimacy. Um, but if you look at the other claimant states where there are some degree, some degrees, okay, let me be correct about it, of competitive elections such as the Philippines um, and Malaysia, uh, you realize that the South China Sea is relatively muted. It's couched in terms of uh, how far these governments are willing to go cap in hand to China for funds for building infrastructure. So Duterte has actually uh, played both ends of the China card. On the one hand, 
he's known to have, uh, you know, occasionally bashed China for taking away Philippine territory, i.e. the spread lease. Uh, but on the other hand, he has also openly and lavishly praised China for building, uh, you know, important infrastructural upgrades uh, in and around the capital and in the provinces and so on. And uh, one must note uh, that um, in the past two years, uh, despite the pandemic, China kept to its promises and built, uh, I, I believe now, the third bridge over the central river that crosses the capital city of Manila has been built. Now, these are game changes for the Philippine economy because uh, those of us who have traveled to the Philippines will realize that uh, the traffic jams that are notorious in the capital. So if uh, you build these bridges connecting the two halves of the city, it will shave traveling time by hours, literally. And this you know, enhances Chinese soft power uh, in the eyes of the Philippine public. So whenever the, the Filipinos spontaneously protest against China, they, they have to think about you know, all this uh, construction largesse that the Chinese have lavished upon them, uh, you know, before they said, oh, China is the thief of Philippine territory in the South China Sea and so on. So, you know, it has to be nuanced in that way. Uh, the same thing with non-claimant Singapore. Uh, you realize that a lot of infrastructure in Singapore has been built by Chinese construction firms. So whenever the government here says uh, we need to adopt a principle stands with reference to UNCLOS and other forms of international law regarding the spread lease, uh, they usually leave it at that. They do not openly say China is uh, the enemy of, of all of Southeast Asia. They leave it open-ended. Uh, and of course, if you look at Malaysia, you know, the, the reaction, that, or rather any anger at all against Chinese uh, aggressive actions in, in uh you know, fortifying the islands is relatively muted apart from uh, your usual, you know, uh, tough worded diplomatic protest sent to the embassy in Kuala Lumpur. By and large, uh, Malaysia, I think, is dependent on Chinese infrastructural, uh, you know, funding for building some of the mega projects like roads in, in the coastal states. And I think soon they're going to revive this thing uh, about the high-speed rail line with connecting Singapore and Kuala Lumpur. And, and the Chinese are favoured to win this bid if this project is ever revived. So uh, again, you know, uh, China has, uh, to quote Alfred's phrase there, use this clever salami slicing tactic to ensure that no one openly in Southeast Asia objects to Chinese quote-unquote aggression uh, in claiming uh, the South China Sea Islands. Alfred, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, if I just want to, uh, I want to add just, just a few weeks ago, my Czech University, Palatsk University, we, we commissioned a survey in 15 Indo-Pacific countries asking about image of China, but other great powers. And in regard to the Philippines, the findings were, were really fascinating because they are fully in line with the other opinion polls. So China, Philippine citizens are very similar to Vietnamese ones, the most China critical ones. Of course, that's mostly related to the South China Sea, especially if you ask specifically about this dispute. However, and this confirms what Ellen just said, I was in fact surprised the perception of the Philippines on the Belt and Road Initiative were very positive. So it's kind of mixed perception in the Philippines. So China is, I see, is regarded probably very realistic in regard to the South China Sea as risk, maybe even threat, but economically there are some benefits. But let me just add, I think that's also similar in both Vietnam and the Philippines. The public sentiment in the South China Sea makes it very difficult for the Philippine government, but also the Vietnamese one to make compromises with China on any issues related to territorial or sovereignty rights. So nationalism is, is very strong in, in these countries, not only in, in China. And my last point that leads back to, to Julia's introduction right now, I think that the, the South China Sea will become also a more prominent topic in, in Europe not least because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Because here we have a strong actor, China, 
a great power, member of the UN Security Council, which is also in breach of international law because China does not accept the ruling of the permanent court of arbitration, which as we have heard is very much in favor of the Philippines and contradicts China's claim and the legality of the nine dash line. China completely ignores it. And we also are aware about the current rhetorics that we need to strengthen the rules-based multilateral order, so more support for international law. And in case of the South China Sea, again, China is in breach of international law. And it also challenges the key principles of freedom of navigation and freedom of trade, which is also important for the European Union, because more than one third of our trade passes through the South China Sea, and we have to be very careful and monitor what's going on there as well. Thank you. Uh, I, um, I'm going to ask my follow-up question on the European Union later. Um, we are nearing uh, the end, and I, I would like to give the audience also the uh, an opportunity. But before we do that, uh, to ask questions and uh, and maybe make comments, I don't know. Um, but before before we do that, uh, both of you already hinted a little bit into this direction, uh, especially you, Alfred. Now, could you please, like, very briefly, um, give an evaluation about future developments, the outlook in this conflict? So, will it will it become more um, uh, uh, like more perilous? Uh, is, is there is there hope that these conflicts uh, are going to be uh, solved at the certain point, especially with international institutions? Uh, and organizations trying to mediate uh, and, and, um, and settle disputes. Uh, wh what's your take, Alan? What's your outlook? Well, uh, Alfred has actually hit the nail on the head spot on when he says that, you know, uh, the public opinion towards China is split. Um, you know, so that translates basically to non-action when it comes to even floating any idea of a third-party arbitration. And um, again, the, uh, due to the length of, of today's discussion, I wasn't able to spend time discussing uh, the declaration of conduct and the ongoing negotiations for a more slightly more binding code of conduct uh, in the South China Sea. And I, I bet this is a large part of Alfred's book as well. So this is additional promotion for him. Um, Okay, this, this DOC, Declaration of Conduct, which is in force, is a loose set of principles adopted in 1992, which uh, indicates that both China and uh, the Southeast Asian states, collectively ASEAN, need to abide by, to avoid any uh, inadvertent armed conflict uh, in the South China Sea waters. Of course, you know, they were referring to, you know, ship-to-ship -ship encounters, air-to-air -air encounters, or air-to-ship encounters, and so on. Uh, and of course, it's non-binding. The code of conduct is supposed to be a little bit more binding, but of course, it's up to international lawyers out there in the audience to decide how to creatively interpret these, you know, to tie China's hands or any other claimant's hands, uh, and, and so on. So the code of conduct is still under negotiation, and, and the word has it that China is driving a very hard bargain. You know, if you want me to agree to bind myself to limit future construction activities, blah, blah, blah. This is what I hear. Again, I can't quote anybody, you know, with such views. You know, it seems like China would say, you must give me something. All right. So the, the back and forth still goes on, and there appears to be no end in sight uh, to what can be done to resolve this dispute. But as Alfred will probably second me on this, this is typical of uh, diplomacy in this part of Asia. Uh, not necessarily the Indo part, all right, but certainly the Pacific Rim part of uh, East Asia, where, you know, if disputes cannot be resolved, you put up with endless provocation short of a shooting incident, all right? You can flash radar at one another's sea craft or aircraft uh, and make angry noises but you don't take further provocative actions and you leave things as they are and there will be moments when you know the diplomatic waters will, will 
get heated and then they will cool down and we can live with that. And, and this is how the imperfect Asia-Pacific peace is kept. Thank you. Um, Alfred, what's your outlook? Thank you very much, Anne. Yeah, I really need to second you again. So let me start. Probably our colleagues from international law department don't like to hear it, but I also believe that international law, it can only offer guidelines. But as we have seen in the past, international law, young, young laws have yeah, triggered the conflict rather than help to, to resolve it. So what we do need is not a legal solution, but a political resolution of the dispute, of course, based on international law. And the code of conduct would be a way forward, not least in regard to trust building, because I think it would be difficult, even so if it would be binding to enforce it against China. I think that's, that's logical that China will not really yeah, accept it. So, I would say in the next five years, it will be more of the same. So China will act more assertive, UNS will push China back, and the small Southeast Asian nations, they will try to hedge and find a way to live with both superpowers and benefit from the relations with them. So positively speaking, I think, and here ASEAN has, has a big role, it's only possible to manage and mitigate the dispute in the next couple of years, but it's impossible to politically resolve it. One possible means, and that has been discussed and in fact implemented before, but not with much success, and that's actually also related to a question from our audience from, from Saba, Basically, it's about the resources, the minerals, oil, gas. And if we find more, would it push to a peaceful resolution or on the contrary to more conflicts between the, the claimant parties? I would say, trying to end positively, a way to mitigate and maybe even resolve the dispute is joint resource exploration and development that has been practiced before about 15 years ago between China, Philippines, and uh, Malaysia, but it didn't work out because the three parties didn't trust each other enough. Everyone claimed that China benefited more. And again, it was in particular the, the public, the civil society, that was very critical that their own government made too many concessions to China. So therefore, this contract or this agreement was not renewed. But if maybe if ASEAN is kind of sponsor of such an agreement, it can build trust and what would be necessary that the resources would be really, really shared equally on a fair base so everyone can benefit from it and see that cooperation benefits <clears throat> all. And it's much better, of course, than going through to a war because of oil, gas or fish or anything else. So this would be one way, but again, a lot of trust is needed and it would be a long-term process as well. Thank you. That's uh, very intriguing. Um, the, the outlooks and, and everything that you told us today. So and I, I would like to give the, uh, the floor to the, to the audience um, in the offline and online. Um, Alfred, you've already responded to one of the question, uh, to one question in the, in the online audience. And I would like to invite the audience here as well um, to raise questions and comments. Okay, while um, I think we wait for the next question, can I respond to the one is, that's already in the Q&A channel by Saba? Uh, Alfred has responded partly to it. Uh, okay, thanks Saba for the question, for, for the query comment question. Uh, it allows me actually to address one point which I did not have time to address on my second last slide. Uh, if you recall, I showed you this table of uh, all the cross-cutting alliances amongst these oil and gas companies uh, who are drilling in the South China Sea. They, they are not technically drilling in the disputed uh, islands' waters yet, but they're drilling very close to them. And what's fascinating in that table, which uh, 
I've plucked from the Energy Information Administration of the United States uh, is that everybody is, pardon the phrase, sleeping with everybody else. So the Chinese uh, state-owned oil company, PetroChina, is in bed with uh, American companies and, and you know, um, Malaysian companies and Vietnamese, you know, oil and gas companies. So in in this complicated picture, I don't think that uh, we are heading towards a war situation. Uh, rather, I think this can actually produce an imperfect peace, a status quo kind of situation where because uh, everybody has a horse in the race, uh, you don't want to upset things beyond what they already are. So um, there is another map which I had shown before to, to my graduate classes uh, a few years ago, where some oil and gas companies have actually projected this unusual uh, map of pipelines crisscrossing every possible economy around the disputed islands, uh, indicating that that's how the oil and gas market is going to shape up over the spread lease and paracels. Everybody will be selling a cut to everybody else, and there's no need for war because everybody will get their energy security, uh, you know, assured. Hey, thank you. So please, the question from the audience. Yes, thank, uh, thank you. And this is a very cute microphone, I must say. Um, thank you for such insightful uh, seminars to all three of you. Uh, my question is uh, more related to also America, I would say since America was mentioned by Alfred before. Um, uh, both of you mentioned that um, uh, the, re, uh, the ASEAN, ASEANIC countries uh, have a very difficult relationship or challenging relationship with China. Uh, public uh, preserves uh, China as in a negative light, while uh, the One Belt initiated by Chinese government is portrayed in a very positive light. So that kind of uh, challenges the whole uh, uh, dynamic between all these uh, countries. So my question is that, uh, what do you guys think um, uh, why the TPP initiated by uh, President Obama failed in uh, ASEAN countries. Uh, initially, I thought maybe uh, when both of you said um, uh, Chinese construction field is very important for countries like Malaysia, Vietnam, but uh, at the same time, the TPP initiative, uh, for an example, in Vietnam, the agreement was quite adjusted a little bit. Uh, for example, aside the economic trade, um, it also allowed a lot of free construction work, a lot of building, and um, uh, mostly, yeah, mostly constructive work was uh, mentioned in that agreement, but TPP agreement still failed in Asia. It still failed uh, to get uh, as much as uh, highlight of popularity as One Belt Initiative. So what are your opinions on it? Thank you. Okay, I'll give the floor to Alfred. I've spoken quite a bit. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, happy to, to answer. Thanks for, for this really intriguing question. Well, the, the TPP, the, the issue is it failed because of Donald Trump. So it was he was two days in office and then he cancelled Obama's initiative, which I, not only I believe, was, was a big mistake because on the one side, Trump focused strongly on, on Southeast Asia, Indo-Pacific security-wise, but he failed to build a strong economic pillar. And that was the intention of the previous Obama administration. Nevertheless, Trump came up, and now in particular Biden, with a kind of counter Belt and Road initiative. And it's not only the US, it's also Japan, which is strongly engaged in infrastructure and connectivity. And since last year also, we have to mention the European Union with its Global Gateway Initiative. So the, the other big actors are very much aware that China uses the Belt and Road Initiative to gain more economic or the political influence to increase its soft power and counter initiatives in regard to connectivity infrastructure. I think they're also much more visible or beneficial in the eyes of the public than a very 
complex and abstract trade agreement or economic cooperation because that's on paper but it's very difficult to see for the for the ordinary citizens that the clear benefits but Ellen has, has given a really good example a new bridge in Manila of course you notice you save a lot of time when you can cross it so you see oh China built it thanks to China so maybe there will be a second or third bridge built by the US and EU and then hopefully the Filipino citizens will say thanks US thanks European Union okay thank you uh, I'm afraid it's already 10 o'clock so we're out of time uh, unless we have a very very important question last question um, I think the organizers would want me to <laughs> wrap up <laughs> uh, um, Thank you very much for all of you, uh, for the both of you, uh, for your, uh, for sharing your knowledge and insights with us, uh, for preparing so well, and also for the questions from the audience, the two questions. Um, and uh, I think we we learned a lot. It was a very intriguing event today, and I'm looking forward to tomorrow's event when we will uh, look more into the perspective uh, from the from from the civil society and also from social actors uh, because today we focused on the state actors so tomorrow we'll have a look at how society members of society and their interests are um, are affected by the conflict in the south uh, South China Sea. So I invite everybody uh, from today uh, including our speakers to join us tomorrow at nine o'clock. Uh, here at Bergen Global. And uh, again, thanks and have a um, wonderful and productive day. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. <laughs>